Hey there, and welcome to the Pseudo Show, brought to you by the Destination Linux Network. Today starts an installment of Pseudo Show Careers. Today I bring on my friend Neil Gompa to talk about his career journey. All that and more on the Pseudo Show. Hey there, and welcome to the Pseudo Show, where business meets open source. I'm Brandon, and this week I'm kicking off a recurring series that we'll be exploring throughout the year around careers and technology. But before we get started on today's topic, a little housekeeping. Last couple episodes, the audio has been less than stellar. I've corrected some of the issues on the editing front and with the mic. I have a new editor that will be doing the editing starting in April. I've put more sound treatment in the room I'm recording in, but I'm also going to be renting a recording studio whenever I have that ability. Second, The Pseudo Show now has a dedicated YouTube channel. Please subscribe to The Pseudo Show channel on YouTube. I will be expanding the content of The Pseudo Show with video content for topics that don't make sense for an audio-only format, such as software deep dives, how-tos, The link for the YouTube channel will be in the show notes. Throughout the year, I'm going to be asking people to come on the show and tell their story about their career progression, how they land in a space they are now, hopefully to inspire others that want to get a start in technology, whether they're fresh out of school or looking for a midlife career change. Technology careers have several different paths, the operations path, the developer path, technical product manager, technical marketing, and technical sales, to name a few. Today, we're going to talk about the path of one of our fellow technologists took to become a DevOps engineer. To unpack this, I'm joined by Neil Gompa. Neil is known in the Destination Linux community as an open source advocate, Fedora, CentOS Stream, and OpenSUSE contributor, and that's just his hobby. Neil is also a senior DevOps engineer at Datto. Datto is a leader in in providing leading MSP solutions, including network and backup solutions. This episode of the Pseudo Show is brought to you by DigitalOcean. Head on over to do.co slash tux2022 to get started with a $100 credit. DigitalOcean has a comprehensive portfolio of compute, storage, database, and networking products that put your cloud infrastructure in capable hands so you and your teams can get back to doing what matters most, building world-changing apps that grow your business. Predictable pricing, robust product docs, and services that developers love get support at every stage of growth with simple, powerful cloud computing. Get growing at DigitalOcean. As a listener of the Pseudo Show and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free In fact, it's better than free because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you sign up at do.co slash tux2022. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of The Pseudo Show. Today's episode is brought to you by Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and business organizations to store, share, and sync sensitive data. Bitwarden is an open source password management tool whose feature set rivals any other tool on the market today. Not only is Bitwarden open source, it is regularly audited by third party security professionals. You can get started for free at bitwarden.com slash DLN and plans start at just $10 per year. Thank you to Bitwarden for sponsoring the pseudo show and the entire Destination Linux network. Hey, Neil, it's good to have you on the Pseudo Show. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing fantastic. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you for coming on. And I, you know, today, we're, uh, as I mentioned in the intro, I wanted to bring on someone that does DevOps as their day job, day to day. And as part of that, we're I'm bringing on t- people that I know are uh, have these uh buzzwordy titles <laughs> <laughs> that's a way to put it so whether that's an sre devops really i kind of i kind of lump both of those two together i know i know that can be a bit controversial but more or less kind of the 
I mean, I kind of agree with you. I think the two are more similar than they are different. So, Neil, like right at the bat, you know, I want to talk about your journey, how how you got here. So, when did you first have an interest in technology? When did you realize this is what you wanted to do? Oh, Lord. Uh, So, as my parents tell me, I was interested in technology probably from the day I was born. Uh, <laughs> they didn't say it exactly like that, but I like saying it that way because it's so much fun. Um, but uh, ever since I, I was a little kid from when I could remember, I've always had an interest in in technology and in computers and things like that. Um, it was, to me, not just about just the blinking lights and the fact that everything like changes and it can just do stuff when you press buttons, but it was also about there's something intrinsically strong about being able to like work with the machine. I, I think people that are auto heads and gear heads would kind of understand the feeling of like, you can work with it and you can mold it and you can make it your own to me. Like I've never been a particularly hardware heavy, like super um, mechanically um, str- good, good at mechanical stuff kind of thing. But working with software and working with UX and like doing basic assembly stuff, examining stuff and like tweaking and things like that. Those are all fun things I like doing too. And with computers, I I felt, and I could do it and I saw results immediately and it was very quick and I got that satisfaction. And there's just this longer, this is longer um, road that of things I could do. And I always felt really happy about working with technology, especially with computers. I, I, I I, th- I think I've said this to you before. I, I think I've even said it on this show. Like uh, technology for me, it's uh, not what I do; it's who I am. But yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't totally know agree how with that. to do anything else. Like it's uh, <laughs> I it's it, I'm paraphrasing from one of my favorite authors. Like he used to say, "Writing is what I is what I am, not what I do." And he didn't know how to do anything else. And I, I, I feel that same way every single time I talk to someone about, oh, yeah, I'll, uh, maybe I'll get into business development. I'm like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know what, where to even start. <laughs> and granted, I'm in kind of like this weird hybrid of technology and business development in my current role. But it's been uh, I, I don't know. Like, I, yeah, I, could, I couldn't do anything else. And it. Honestly, I think the business side of technology and, and IT is is a really interesting part of it. And it, and people underestimate how much it influences how the technology side develops too. It's, you know, as as in my career, I've and even like even before I went to college and all that stuff, like even though I knew I was going to go into technology and I knew I was going to be into computers, I also felt like I wanted to understand computers as a whole. And that meant not just the tech part, but the business part and the people parts like those mattered to me. So I, I made sure that I learned those things in college and in my career. Did you uh, ever feel like you should change major majors when you were in college? I, I, I did when I was going to school and it just was like, I was like, should I keep going in technology or should I go down the business path or do something else? Like what did you ever have that inkling or did I did have a, I did have a brief moment where I thought about maybe I want to pivot into business because I thought about starting my own, uh, doing a startup and starting my own business, a technology centric business. But that would mean, you know, I should probably do a little pivot here and like pick up some more business skills and whatnot. Um, But no, I kind of stuck with it. I think uh, early on when I when I was going through my uh, going through the process of going to college, uh, I went to school at Mississippi State University and I got a, a bachelor's in software engineering. At the time, Mississippi State was one of the few schools that actually offered a dedicated software engineering program, which was very interesting to me. They also had a computer engineering program, which included hardware and all that other stuff. Um, and it would have been a couple of extra courses to switch. So I did think about doing that. I thought about pivoting to being like more holistic and doing computer engineering as a whole. Um, but I ultimately decided I didn't like microchips enough to <laughs> want to do that. <laughs> So um, it would have been two extra courses to switch. And I just decided, you know what? I don't like this enough to want to do that. So I stuck with software engineering and I took extra courses on software development lifecycle. I added some electives to do 
learn economics, macro and microeconomics, ethics, some business stuff here and there. Uh, and I sat in on some stuff. I audited a couple of business courses just to kind of get a feel for it, even though I wasn't going to pursue it. Uh, and yeah, I think that that was pretty much like how I felt about it in college. And I think I made the right choice because I learned things like how to do public speaking. I learned how to understand how the market influences development. And I, I was able to apply that knowledge to understand how to influence software development, computer technology, and, and markets. Learning market theory was a massively empowering thing for me. So learning microeconomics and macroeconomics seriously helped um, for me to get a better understanding of how those influence the dynamics of IT um, and software and computers as a whole. So uh, yeah, like I, I don't regret the path I took down. I, I think I'm, I'm happy with the fact that I decided that I'd counterbalance with some what people would consider businessy type courses. And if someone is going to get started in their career and they're at call, they're going into college now, I'd say don't shut out the the business stuff because you're going to be a way better engineer if you. Understand. I had a lot of friends that got IS degrees specifically, MIS degrees, and uh, definitely helped them on the business side for sure because there's a lot more of that in those fields than in that particular major than in in computer science specifically. And that, that's one of the ones that I push people towards if they do decide to go to college for tech or a technology field, if they are like, Oh yeah, I love technology, but I also don't want to be in technology for the rest of my life. Yeah. Uh, I think if, I think the main value college brings to the table, like I know there's a huge discussion about whether if you're in it, do you really need to go to college for all this uh, I'm not going to pass a value judgment on whether or not you should or should not go to college, but I will say that if you are going to go to college, take advantage of the fact that your university program probably gives you the opportunity to branch out a little bit beyond tech because that extra that extra learning can be helpful for your career basically forever. Yeah, you're, you won't be pigeonholed. If you decide you want to change careers, it's a lot easier. Absolutely. Right. And maybe someday I will start a business and do something interesting. Who knows? I have those skills and those learnings from both my career, my college experiences, and you know the tutoring and education, the relationships I formed over the years because of that. And that that's valuable. I'm imagining it's after college, but when when did you just uh, start your career and where did you start it? You start. Oh, yeah. So it actually happened um, not. So my career in software professionally would start um, midway through college. Um, uh, it was part of, you know, uh, at our university, we had this capstone senior project thing where, where we developed a thing for a client and we went through all the software development workflows and things like that. So we did half of it waterfall, half of it agile. We learned about life cycling, customer requirements, all those fun stuff. Um, but as a capstone project, it means we're working with a real client who has real needs. And I consider that part of my my start of my professional career. I know a lot of people don't, but I do, because that's where I learned how to do relationship management um, when it comes when it, with IT relationships. And that's a huge thing that a lot of people undervalue. Um, so that was where I got my start professionally. And then afterwards, uh, my first job um, was at a a small startup like company um, working in embedded um, called Camgen Microsystems. And they uh, hired me as a, what they call a staff engineer or a tech staff engineer, which the funny thing is nowadays that's considered a senior position. But when I, when I was in there, it was considered a junior position. So it's just, it, it blows my mind how the titles have all flipped. Um, yeah. <laughs> T titles keep flipping. Like, like uh, I've it, it, it's strange. Like staff, you, I remember staff used to be known as junior, uh, right? Like you're just part of technical staff. Um, and then you, you were aspiring to like principal or right and beyond principal is still definitely very much higher, but yeah, yeah that sure. didn't flip. Thankfully. <laughs> so yeah. It, it's confusing. 
Yeah, it got weird because like so now it when when I started the which was crap. What was it like nine years ago, ten years ago now? Um, when I started, it was basically your starting point was staff, which was junior. Then you had untitled, which was moderate. Then you had senior. Then you had um, senior, and then you had either principal or architect, or sometimes both as as upper levels. Um, and nowadays, untitled is junior, and senior blows staff. And so it's so like it goes, and associate has disappeared from the from the from the title space. Uh. It hasn't, hasn't where I'm at. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Um, maybe it'll hit you eventually. Um, it seems to be a wave of things. Like it happened to uh, where I work at, uh, at Datto um, a year ago. So we, we dropped associate and level uh, and reorganized things up title wise. Now it, we're, we currently do associate n- untitled senior associate principal principal senior principal and distinguished. I have many questions about what led you to have, if I count six extra titles in that seniority line (laughs) path to, uh, it's a path to, uh, upper to the upper management as an individual contributor. I see Uh, like to an equivalent band or whatever you want to call it. So, it's not a bad idea. I like that. I kind of wish there was more granularity because like right now, as, as I see it in, in, in a lot of places, the it's, it's huge, huge jumps and it's harder for people to, that mobility is just not there when you make, make it larger and larger jumps. So having incremental jumps makes people feel like they're being more successful and they're able to grow. Um, but yeah, so like that's, that's pretty much like the, the career progression there. And it's just, uh, at there, I did embedded applications development, and I hated it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I like so. I, I learned. Uh, I thought it would be fine because, like, you know, embedded applications. Oh, it's just working with C and maybe a little bit of assembler. But I'm not like doing chip work or whatever. No, embedded applications development is terrible. You don't have an operating system and you have to do a whole bunch of work by hand and you're doing your own tool chain stuff because every embedded platform has its own custom tool chain and you hate yourself doing all of it because uh, like I I primarily wrote in Python and C++. Well, the tool chain that I was given didn't have either of those languages supported. And so um, the tool chain I was working with, one of the engineers that was at the company uh, wrote his own object-oriented programming model on top of C and told me to use it. And there was no documentation on how it worked, and I had to figure out how to use it, and I couldn't. And so that made me hate myself the whole time I was working on it. And that's why I don't like embedded applications development now. Uh, I, I don't blame you. There, there, is, a, there is an object-oriented uh, language built on top of C that is everyone everyone that has worked in it including my own worst nightmare and that's C plus plus and someone else writing their own fun little thing on top of C. Uh, that sounds even more of a nightmare to me. Oh man. Like I, (laughs) I learned so many bad things about pointers that I didn't want to ever know. Uh, like as I learned so much about the implementation details of how objects and classes work because he the the developer that made it completely created their own way to do it with structs and function pointers and like it, and and they faked uh um they faked um public protected and private attributes with with weird things that i just they shall not be spoken of like it was it was absolutely like it cemented in me. I want to be higher level than this. I never want to do this again. Um, and actually, I flamed out uh, in there, and um, that's when I pivoted my career, actually out of software development entirely, into QA. I decided I'm going to. I, w- I decided when I I came to work at Datto, which is where I currently work today. I came to work at Datto in 2015. I decided I wanted to be a QA automation engineer because that's like that's so many levels of high uh, higher level that like 
I'm probably not going to do weird code development things. Probably I'll just I'll just get to work with like writing scripts and stuff, and then I can like relax my pained brain and like figure out how to reinvent myself. Um, yeah, so that was a surprise in a different way. So I got I got there and and it turned into yeah. So QA automation engineer, which I which was what I was. Um, wound up being a lot like DevOps. I wound up setting up infrastructure and writing tooling and gluing stuff in, building workflows to pivot back and forth between testing and, and development. And, and if this if you hear all that, you think, wow, this is like my job and you're a DevOps or an SRE or whatever, you'd be right because that's what happened to me like a few months later. Like nine months into that, they're like, Neil, you do nothing like what we expect you to do. Here's a new title for you. And this is where production engine, I was a production engineer, which then became DevOps and systems engineer, and then DevOps engineer, which is where I, uh, and now I'm a senior DevOps engineer. You're hoping to rest your brain and this job was basically hold my beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As it turns out, I don't think I can help myself and I just make the world a better place. At least I try to. Um, and and I just have a predilection towards just doing my best to, with all the skills and knowledge I have, to try to pull off things that make, hopefully make other people have a better experience. Like, I have a tendency towards wanting to help others make things better and also putting everything I've got into what I'm trying to do. Getting into, uh, you know, accidentally getting into DevOps, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much how I would, I, would, I would view it. So accidentally stumbling into this, would you say that do it, doing DevOps or doing it DevOps-y things, wh- however you want to define DevOps, as I swear, <laughs> everyone has its own definition. I know the definition of DevOps is essentially, yeah, essentially break down the walls uh, between Dev and Ops, and you know, so devs just not lobbing code over the fence to ops, and ops just not lobbing it back. You work together mm-hmm. and really make that work. At least in your organization, and based on what you think of as DevOps, maybe even define it from your point of view. How much has that been reality working with the developers in your organization and work? And uh, I don't know which side you're specifically on at Datto. Uh, how, how much is that uh, as DevOps been as it's defined as an industry? How how, uh, how how would you say it's been? So some interesting inside baseball here. My team, which is the DevOps team, uh, we have a team of DevOps engineers that helps to support the soft in- software engineering teams. Has actually bounced back and forth between software engineering and infrastructure engineering where we were hosted in in the company. That experience of bouncing back and forth organizationally, I think gave us some interesting perspectives on how to like break down these walls and our function has evolved as part of that. And these days I think I think we're we're on that path to being like breaking down those silos in a very permanent way. I consider what my what the group I'm part of does is to be more of a partnership with the software engineering teams and the and the infrastructure engineers that that maintain the the platforms. So if I were to define myself in the old, you know, not cool industry terms, I would say I'm a little bit of a combination of release engineering and and um, platform engineering. And, and if I put a little bit of, I sprinkle a little bit of both and, and, and I bring that expertise and that, and that effort to both sides, both the, um, the, the systems engineers and the cloud engineers, as well as the SREs and the, the de- software developers that are working the software engineering side, I bring those together and it makes it so that we can build smoother paths to successful delivery across the board. So like I often describe it to when I'm interviewing new hires, uh, potential, not necessarily new hires, but interviewing people to come on to our team is, you know, I do everything related to software delivery. Um, and that's what 
And that often means working with the software engineering teams and working with the infrastructure teams to optimize that software delivery for everyone. You know, when you're helping to interview new DevOps engineers, or even, and like we kind of said this at the beginning, a little controversial, or SRE, <laughs> what are you looking for? Like, what, what are the skills that would you say that if someone wants to get into this particular area, what skills should they have? Should they focus on? What are you, what, what's data looking for? I, I might be able to answer this a little too. It's a little too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, I'll start with what kind of like what our organization typically looks at when when we're we're looking for new hires, and then I'll kind of go with what I also look for um, to what makes me feel like this is a someone who'd be successful in a DevOps role. So, from an organizational perspective, someone that knows how to um, do Python stuff, work with uh, work with various tools, having the experience of learning and understanding systems super quick. So being a a quick learner is a nice plus because a lot of times you're thrown into the fire and have to think about architectures and systems and having to put, assemble them together fairly quickly. Um, And you're working with stuff that you may not necessarily get total familiarity on. You don't necessarily have the opportunity to be fully familiar with everything. Having Python uh, to be able to do automation, that's uh, the preferred language of, of our team's automation being able to read and under, understand multiple programming languages very easily. Um, even though we primarily write Python, our team interacts with stuff written in Java, Ruby, Go, PHP, Perl, some Rust, not very much, um, uh, C, C++, uh, and, and there's probably more. Oh, and some .NET languages. I know C Sharp is in there. There's some VB.NET stuff. It's there's there's a fair bit like and PowerShell and Bash <laughs> everything. and like all, everything, everything, all the things. So like f- from a core perspective, POSIX shell, particularly Bash and and Python are great starting points. And just being and getting familiar with those languages and also understanding the fundamental concepts so that you can quickly grok other languages and other stacks is really valuable. Um, then going from that, I look for people who are good communicators who can actually sympathize or empathize with people and be able to build bridges and 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 establish relationships that make it so that people like working with you and support you and and you can be paid in kind in both directions. Yeah, you can't be the grumpy engineer. Right. <laughs> so my, uh, my, my, from my point of view, a lot of what DevOps, whether like specifically people being hired as a DevOps engineer, it's automation. You're, oh a, yeah, for sure. You're an automation developer more or less. And mm-hmm. so I have been pushing people that whenever someone asks me, I want to be a DevOps engineer. Learn a programming language, just one. Doesn't need to be <laughs> special. As soon as you learn one, you you, you can read most. Hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. Don't ask me to read Haskell. <laughs> 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 or OCaml. You're, you're, I've had to deal with both of those in my career, and those are different. <laughs> you're you're bringing me back. <laughs> Number. Uh, number two skill is one of the automation platforms. Yes. Whether that's Ansible, Salt, Puppet, Chef, CF Engine, doesn't matter. Learn <laughs> one of them. Obviously, I'm going to push people towards one, and mm-hmm. that's Ansible because it's the best. No bias I, I, here at all. No, no, there's no bias at all. But you know what? I'll back you up a little bit. Ansible is so at, 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 Um, data we have started down our ansible journey and i am like i I like i say to people i'm ansible dumb i don't know what the heck i'm doing in ansible right now but it's been really easy for me to like pick it up and get started and start and like 
start working with it. Certainly my ramp up to Ansible has been a lot easier than my ramp up to Puppet, which is what we historically have used. And Salt and 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 Shiv. Everything else. <laughs> and everything else. I, I would say that if uh, the two big ones I often see people looking at in the industry from automation tools are Ansible and Chef. Those two tend to be the big ones because they compete on different models of automation. So Ansible's a lot more on the declarative side and agentless. And then um, Chef is its exact opposite. It's imperative. You write straight Ruby. It has an agent and it does drift management out of the box and all yep. those things. And so like, it depends on how your organization thinks about auto how system should be managed, whether you'll wind up going down one road or the other. But I'd say those two are kind of the best in their categories. Anyone who has a development background, I have found really love Chef. Mm -hmm. I used to write Ruby all day long, so I really like Chef. But Ansible is just so easy. The default language for writing modules is Python. Right. So so it, it's just easy to get going and it, it's easy to get into. Whether if you're a system administrator that just does bash. So it's easy to do. It's easy. And it will replace a lot of those bash scripts. That's what I love about it. And it's fully yeah. integrated in with most of the uh, enterprise Linux distributions already. So it's mm. just there. It's there. Yeah. And like, I, I kind of lied when I said Ansible is declarative. It's, it's kind of both. Um, you can default to a declarative way of representing things, but because Ansible has a very lightweight but very flexible extension model, you can implement imperatively real logic that can be exposed declaratively for other people who are not necessarily inclined to write that code to be able to use. And so in many ways, I think Ansible represents the best of DevOps in a relationship perspective because it bridges that development with the um, operations in the sense of like, developers and and those types of folks would write python code to bridge to like implement functionality to orchestrate their stuff and then operator operators can actually then turn around and use the declarative input method of those uh, uh to the at orchestrate those modules to do the things that they need to do and so i often say to myself and others when they ask me like uh, the reason why I think Ansible is so good isn't because of the agent versus agent list stuff. Like mm -hmm. that's a matter of opinion, right? But it's because it actually represents this bridging these two worlds together in such a nice way. Yeah. The other, uh, one, one, my one last skill and I'll re we'll, and then uh, go to the next part of this, but is understanding CI and CI oh, CD. man, like, <laughs> CI is hard. <laughs> I, I, I like it, it's so funny because, like, th this tells you how long I have been working in this space. Uh, the first tool that keeps coming to mind wh when I think of this is Hudson, but it's not Hudson anymore, it's Jenkins. That's so, been Hudson for 10 years, dude. <laughs> I know, but it keeps coming into my head. So, and I, you know, that's obviously, you know, Jenkins, obviously the most common. I've been working a lot more with Tecton and, uh, and then, uh, from a get ops perspective, uh, Argo CD mm -hmm. for, for that on that continuous delivery front. So I, I highly recommend every, just, just, if you're getting into it, those are the, the, I think those are the skills that people need, need, uh, from, from the data perspective. Um, we are very much around GitLab CI. So that's what we use internally. Um, but we also have public projects on GitHub and GitLab.com. And so that means we work with GitHub Actions. We work with Git, GitLab CI. We also work with BuildBot because we have things that we have projects we contribute to that use BuildBot. And I'm personally familiar with BuildBot. And one of our projects, uh, one of those, th and BuildBot's a, a favorite go-to for things that need just super weird types of CI, because one of the things that I think a lot of people don't quite get is that the CI is a reflection of the complexity of your software. Same goes for packaging, same goes for delivery. All of that stuff is always, it's always a mirror 
of how difficult you've made your software or how complex you've made your software. If your software is difficult for people to understand how it is assembled, it will be difficult to deploy into reality. Um, and that is, it'll be difficult to test. It'll be difficult to deploy. And I know this is a controversial opinion, but people should really try to stick to simpler architectures because the more complicated you make it, the harder it is for everyone else around you. And so like I, you know, there's this, there's this kick about microservices. I know lots of people talk about it. I have a very controversial opinion. Don't think about microservices until your, uh, until your simple service architecture breaks down because microservices introduces a whole lot of complexity for a lot of organizations that isn't worth it. You can keep microservice architecture simple. It's just, you got to keep it. You can't overthink it. And the way right. I always put it, uh, you know, I'll quote Scotty, uh, the, the more you complicate the plumbing, the easier it is to clog the drain. It's a very <laughs> good, I like that. I like that. I'm going to steal that. Cause that's a really good analogy. Yeah. It's a uh, star Trek three. <laughs> uh, search for Spock. So You've been talking to Michael again, haven't you? <laughs> no, I, that I love Star Trek. <laughs> so, uh, you Neil, know, one last question, uh, and we can wrap this up. But I, if you met someone that seemed to be going down a similar path that you've gone down, what I, I, you know, I was going to say, if you could met your younger self. What, what advice would you give your younger self? But that, that's so cliche. Uh, and yeah. really this one is just as cliche, but I think it's easier because like you're thinking, not thinking about what advice would you give yourself? It's what advice would you give someone else that is going down a similar path? path? I think one of the earliest mistakes I made that I would, I would make others not, I would tell others to not do is I didn't, I didn't try to do this in a way that I could, I didn't try to do this myself in some way. Like, so I don't have a home lab. Um, I don't have a way to experiment with a lot of this stuff that the world talks about on a day to day. And I think that that still hurts me today. Like I, there's a number of factors that you're already aware of, and it's not really all that important right now that I don't have a functioning home lab. And I haven't had one for a few years now. Um, and it's really unfortunate and it hurts. One of the things I would tell anyone who wants to go down this path is figure out a way to have a home lab and play with this stuff because, uh, and that doesn't have to be physical machines in your local, in your house or whatever. It doesn't have to literally be a lab at home. It could be do something in AWS or GCP or whatever, or, you know, if you're involved in uh, an open source project that needs infrastructure, and they've got systems that they need help with to do this kind of stuff, get involved with them. Like, for example, I will plug the Fedora infrastructure folks and the OpenSUSE heroes. Both of them are great and they have a great process for bringing on new people. And you get the ability to work with all these you know, DevOps technologies, I hate that phrase, but like basically the the stuff that you will wind up using in your career. And it's a lot less stressful and a lot more friendly and you don't have to shoulder the burden yourself and it gives you a much easier path to learn all these things. So like, if you want to go down this road, I would say, you know, go to like, say the Fedora project or the OpenSUSE project, go check out their infrastructure teams and say, how can I help? I would like to learn this stuff because I, I am excited about these kinds of things and I want to get involved and I want, and I feel like I, I would have a great opportunity to learn these things here. Cause that's true. And I think that would make you a much more successful person, especially with like 10 years ago, this, this stuff was so much easier. This stuff was so much simpler. Now you need a Kubernetes system, like an OpenShift, which personally, one of my favorite Kubernetes platforms, uh, because it gives you a lot of the tooling up front that you, have to, that you don't have to figure out. But if you're not privileged to, to be able to use an OpenShift system or an OKD system, which is freely the freely available alternative to it, um, you know, like if you're working with Kubernetes or Rancher or... Uh, our rancher RKE or K3S or MicroShift or any of these others or or MicroKates, all these platforms, 
you know, it's a lot of work to stand up and configure and do all that stuff. And learning alone with like no assistance from anyone is really demoralizing, or at least it was for me. And so like getting, getting to have the opportunity to work in these environments and learn it at, at a, at a not very stressful way is something that would be tremendously valuable for the DevOps, the up aspiring DevOps engineer of today. Uh, one of the things I'll comment on, I normally don't cro- cross the streams with my day job and the podcast. I know one of the big barriers with Kubernetes in general is the hardware requirements. requirements. Yeah, that's why I don't have one. Yeah, if you want to play around with it, though, I don't remember the exact URL, but I'll, I'll find it and I'll, it'll be in the show notes. Go to I believe it's on developers.redhat.com. You can get access to the OpenShift sandbox, and oh. and in the sa- and you can then play with it. Uh, I think it's uh, available for like thirty days. I don't remember the exact time frame. That'll also be in the show notes, and it'll also be clear on the on the website. But like get that, it's a just allows you to have that low barrier to entry to just try it and learn all the bits and pieces and components. And the other thing is MicroShift because MicroShift is a basically full OpenShift and Kubernetes that can run in Podman. So you don't even have to worry about it. So if you can't afford the lab, you don't have to go down that path. And that, that's usually my, my thought. Like if you just have your laptop, Podman and MicroShift or uh, go to developers.redhat.com. Oh, I'll have to check that out at some point. Um, but yeah, like nowadays with this Kubernetes architecture, people tend to very complex systems and it's, it's, it's a barrier to entry for sure. I, I honestly am not sure that a lot of the Kubernetes community folks are even seriously considering this problem. I, I worry about whether it's going to end up with the same fate that OpenStack is. Like when I started getting involved in this, OpenStack was all the rage, but like I seriously struggled to set up an OpenStack deployment. Like it took me a lot of work to figure out how to get an OpenStack deployment going. I have one and I regret every moment of it. OpenStack is hard. <laughs> and I will leave it at that. <laughs> 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 so thank you, Neil, for, for, for having this conversation with me. I really do appreciate you coming on the show. And I know we'll be uh, having more conversations on the pseudo show here pretty soon. Pretty soon. Oh, yeah. I am really enjoying this. And I'm looking forward to, to those future conversations and digging into more about DevOps. It's a lot of fun hanging out with you and chatting. Thanks, Neil. I appreciate it. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. As always, your feedback is welcome. Head on over to pseudo.show slash discuss. If you l- like more of the pseudo show, head on over to pseudo.show and on social media at pseudo show podcast. You can catch more awesome content at our network partners, destination Linux.network. You can support the show on Patreon at pseudo.show slash Patreon or sponsor us at pseudo.show slash sponsor us. There'll be links in the show notes. Neil, anywhere you'd like to send our listeners. So I work at Datto, and if, you, if you're interested in coming to work with me um, at Datto, check out our careers page at datto.com slash careers. Um, I'm sure Brandon will make sure there's a link in the show notes. Check out the Fedora project and their Fedora infrastructure team and the OpenSUSE Heroes team. Again, I'll make sure that Brandon has links in the show notes for both of those. Uh, and if you want to follow me on Twitter, I am Detective Conan Kudo, D-E-T underscore Conan underscore Kudo. I'm also on Mastodon um, at Conan underscore kudo at fostodon.org. Um, I'm on Matrix as well and a couple of other places, but those two are the main ones where if you you know want to reach out to me and have a chat or whatever, feel free uh, to to send a message my way and and we can have a chat. We can have a chat. You can, can follow chat. me on most social media at dbrandon Johnson or my website open-tech.net and new content at destinationlinux.network. Thank you for listening to the pseudo show where business meets open source. Until next time. Time.